But when you look somebody in the eye and say, I know what that feels like. I've been there too. The, the credibility and assurance and hope in that is way better than any book you're going to read, any academics. And, and so community can provide some of that, like, hmm, I'm not alone. I'm Janet Ahmed, host of Hacks and Hobbies podcast and a digital presence advisor at HumbleZone. This episode is brought to you by Home Studio Mastery. I launched a consultation and course program to help podcasters and course creators to create a space in their homes that will reduce the friction of creating content and appearing their best when showing up on camera. The pandemic gave us a lot of issues, but this one is here to stay. We're now so much closer to our audience thanks to video becoming more popular and affordable. I help guide folks who want to create Hollywood-worthy studios to not only capture great content, but also build more confidence, more authority, and be more comfortable in front of the camera. If I can do it, you can too. And with my help, you can do it faster. So if you'd like to learn more, visit homestudiomastery.com and how you too can create a home studio that brings out your personality, professionalism, and possibilities. Thank you for tuning in to Hacks and Hobbies with your host, Junaid. We're visited by our amazing guests coming from all walks of life who want to learn their story, their struggles, and their journey on how they got to where they are today. So stick around. Today, we get to speak with Eric Wooten. Eric is a dynamic speaker, author, and relationship expert. Now he uses his 15 years of experience as a pastor and licensed professional counselor to help strengthen relationships and organizations. Eric has leveraged his transformative, yet easy to digest frameworks to save countless marriages and create sustainable change at all levels of any organization. I'm so excited to speak with Eric on this episode, so please tune in as we dig in deeper into how Eric got started on this journey. Eric, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I'm excited to have you here. Yeah, I'm excited to be here, Junaid. Thanks for having me. Eric, so we met through SBI Pro, through Celery Mastermind, and it's been amazing watching you grow, watching your journey, and the amazing experiences that you've been creating for your audience, for your people, for your community. And I was like, dude, that's some awesome stuff. I wish I could go <laughs> to one of those experiences. Not that I have any issue, any problems going on, but you, you never know. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You don't, I mean, you don't have to have uh, it, it. I mean, it's like anything else, right? If, right. if we're, if we wait to go to the doctor until there's a ton of pain or you don't go to the <laughs> dentist until, you know, you need a root canal, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot more work, a lot more expensive and not as fun. So part of it is, you know, marriage, just like, like anything else in our life. If, if we're, if we're a little more proactive with, you know, working on it, then yeah. it's not as much work. You're, you're hundred percent right. So tell us a little version of your journey that no one's heard of before, but since this is the first time we're, getting to talk to each other one-on-one -on -one. let's just go right into the story of uh, Eric Wooden yeah so how far back you want to go I mean I don't know how far like on a big on a big wheel at three years old in Germany or you know how far <laughs> we well we can sprinkle some of that but where did you where did you start with the current journey that you're on you know what got you this to this to this yeah level? I think so the current journey uh just to bring listeners up to speed is what I'm doing now is I lead a marriage uh, relationship organization uh, doing a number of things to help couples in relationship. That's where I am now. How I got here was I think kind of helping people. I, I don't know. You can use a million terms, whether mm -hmm. it's pastoring people or shepherding people or coaching people, I think has always been there. So, you know, when you, you think back on sports teams growing up and, mm -hmm. and it was just kind of, is one of those things that people always have felt comfortable 
with me and sharing with me. And so I think you, you recognize those markers along in your life. I never planned to do this, but I think looking back, it's like, yeah, I think I've always been a place that people felt comfortable. People felt I was authentic. I'm a safe place to kind of talk. And so that part, I think is just, you know, God given or, or mm -hmm. parent instructed or whatever you want to say. But yeah. the journey was, I met my wife in college. Uh, we lived in Oregon where her family's from, was working in a family business, her family's business for a number of years, uh, doing pumpkin seed for snack food, which may be a whole nother story. <laughs> and could have done that forever. Money was good. Schedule was flexible. Yeah. But didn't really feel like that was purposeful for me. And so we had always... I'd always been interested in, in marriage and couples and been part of small groups and helping couples and that kind of thing. So I think that had always been part of what I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And then we had been through a number of things in our marriage, just different difficulties early on in marriage to infertility issues um, and then even infidelity. So my wife had stepped outside of the marriage, which was, you know, one of those big moments of kind of like, okay, you know, <laughs> those, those are the moments you look in the mirror and go, you know, what are we doing? And, and what do I want to do here? Yeah. And so I think all of that stuff together kind of ignited even a greater passion to help couples. And so that was 2005 hmm. um, that, that we made a choice to leave the family business. And I went into church ministry for a season just because I didn't really know how to, how do you start a marriage organization? I didn't right. know. I was like, maybe through the church, I can start helping people. And so did that for about 15 years. And then uh, in 2020, March 1 of 2020. So I was part of the cause for the pandemic. Me, yeah. me stepping into this you business, I, you know, accelerated. <laughs> so just in time for, you know, a, a whole new season is when I launched Altered Marriage, which is this uh, organization to help couples. So that that's how we got there to the launch of this. That's quite a journey. I mean, 15 years in, in the ministry, just serving right and then i think your talking style or the way you talk is is a really comforting one as well i was listening to chris voss's master class and one thing that he talks about is the way you communicate with when you're and not to say that this has anything to do with <laughs> interrogation or you know uh fbi interrogation but the way you talk to the assailant or whatever, you know, you bring a level of depth, a level of foundational in your voice, and you're not talking high, you know, you're talking a really comforting voice. So I think the question is, did you always talk that way? Or is that something that you picked up over the past few years? Yeah, I've, I've probably always talked that way on some level. The funny thing is you say that and, and my home office backs up to our master bathroom. And so mm -hmm. my wife will tell me, she's like, quit yelling in there. You're always yelling. You're too loud. And, uh, and so in, in the, you know, in my 15 years in the church world, I did a lot of teaching from stage. So mm. Uh, both small churches and the last church I was at was about 10,000 member, you know, mm -hmm. four campus. Uh, wow. So, so there's an energy level when you're on stage of that size that you have to obviously elevate and give more energy and movement and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But generally, yeah, I'm not the guy that's going to walk in the room and, and be the loudest voice. And and I'm going to, I'm going to blend in the back and observe mm -hmm. and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think that's that's my normal approach and tone. And and then I think the, the reality is when you have a heart for people and you care for people, I think people just see it. You, you know, it's like one of those things you can't you can't fake. And so when you're having a conversation with someone, someone gen, genuinely feels like you care about their life and their experience and what you're asking them. Yeah. You know, I think that's just that that's where some of the warmth or what they what they observe comes from. Oh, this guy actually cares. Yeah, I do. That's why we're talking. You know, what I mean? <laughs> if I didn't, we wouldn't be. No, that's that's really beautiful because the tone of how we put ourselves out also, you know, attracts the type of people that that we're comfortable to talking to as well. Right. You don't want to talk to everybody and anybody and then so Depending on the, the tone and the message that we put out, I think that also brings it the top audience that we're looking for. Now, you also talked about, you know, what what the main, some of the main motivations was you're working on your own marriage, you're working sure. on, on your own self, and then finding out that, hey, 
since I was able to help myself, I'm sure that I can help others facing that same problem. I really like that altered marriage and the pumpkin seeds. <laughs> that's that's definitely a story we'll have to come back to. Yeah, but... yeah, that's a whole whole other <laughs> uh, rabbit trail. Um, just shows you people can make a lot of money doing a lot of things. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right because you're technically you're niched down in that tiny market because I I know a gentleman who runs over 200 beehives. All they do is honey, right? Yeah. They, they sell honey, they sell bees, they sell the broods, they sell the queens. That's it's, it's literally one slice of all the things that they do, but I'm sure they do a lot more or, you know, they take, they had experience from a lot, a lot of other things that they brought to that one specific thing. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So you talked about your motivations. Talk to us through some of the things that our audience can take home with them. For example, uh, what are some of the things that a married couple should be focusing on to have, like you said, you know, you don't want to go to the doctor when your tooth is falling out. And and I'm not, I'm not going to say that I haven't done that, you know. <laughs> I checked my right. tooth. <laughs> I called up my buddy, like, dude, and it's Sunday, and he's like, you know, come on over, let me take a look, what's going on, you know. So he he's very kind to help me with out with that. But we don't want to do that. We want to set up. Uh, you want we want to set up a way that you're you're managing your life. You're you're taking care of the garden along the way, as opposed to just putting out fires. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I agree. I think the funny thing is that, that I'm just kind of logical and practical. Mm -hmm. And so, um, to, to me, relationships are, are pretty simple. They're not easy because yeah. people are complicated. Right. But, but some of the concepts are so simple that, that for me, I think when, when I hear you say that, like, you know, what, what is something people can kind of take away with, um, a lot, a lot of what I do and what I talk about and what happens with couples, I really could break down to three areas. Really. Mm -hmm. I think, I think intentionality, uh, I think community being around other couples, I'm a huge proponent of being in community. Um, and then, and then I would, the last one would be responsibility or personal responsibility. So yeah. how, how are we working? I think those three categories, if we put some effort into those, um, we, we end up in a pretty good place. And so, you know, a lot of what trips couples up is personal issues that have not been dealt with. Right. So, you know, past yeah. wounds and childhood stuff. And, and a lot of times we're looking at the relationship, like there's an issue. And the reality is, you know, I, I whatever, say I grew up in a home that was performance based and I never could have done enough. And, you know, every time I, you know, I went three for four in my baseball game and my yeah. dad wondered why I didn't go four for four or, you know, you, if you come up in that and then you get in a marriage, you know, you're going to be hypersensitive to any type of criticism or feedback from your spouse. And, yeah. and it has really nothing to do with your spouse because we should be able to give each other feedback and grow. And so I think we, you know, we got a responsibility to work on self intentionality is so many. Well, I, I know you have at least one kid, right? Do you have, do you have more? Yes, I have actually have three kids. Okay. And one of them just came in to, you know, give me some cotton candy right now. It's like, yes, there candy. you go. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> marriage is a little different with three kids than mm -hmm. it is with no kids. Yeah. And, and it's most couples find themselves at some point in a situation where, man, it feels like everything we're doing together is logistical. Who's got who for which appointment and which mm -hmm. T-ball game and, or it's problem solving or it's conflict resolving. And, yeah. you know, none of us got married for that. That's not fun. Mm -hmm. And so part of the intentionality is really, I recommend a lot of couples do like a weekly staff meeting, have, have a mm -hmm. meeting once a week, you know, Sundays at seven, you and your wife is when we sit down to do some of the business side of marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have a one that works for a lot of couples who are different, because oftentimes, you know, the planner marries the spontaneous chaos person and it's yeah. so great dating. And then you get frustrated married. So a, a weekly staff meeting helps both of those couples. The planner knows I'm going to get that time every mm -hmm. week and the, 
the spontaneous person is like, I know I only have to have those conversations on Sunday, which frees up the rest of the week to, Mm -hmm. you know, just enjoy each other. There's nothing worse, right. Than sitting down to watch a TV show together and then getting blasted with 27 questions from your wife, the planner. And you're like, yeah, thanks for ruining, you know, peaceful night. So I just think intentionality with making sure I think Dave Ramsey, you know, the finance guy Mm -hmm. said it, it, you know, a budget, if you don't tell your money where to go, like it just kind of goes wherever. So same thing in marriage. If you don't tell business conversations where to go and times of just friendship and connection where to go, the business side of marriage will take over Mm. the whole marriage. And then pretty soon it's like, when's the last time we had fun? So I think, you know, things like when I say intentionality, I mean like staff meetings or date nights or little moments of connection, you know, when all your kids are in bed and, you know, you and your wife may go to bed at different times and you yeah. miss each other. It's like, you know, can you find 15 minutes a couple of times a week just to kind of sit down? And even if it's as small as like, what's your high and low for the day? Like, let's yeah. at least connect on some level that's not, did you pay the bill? You know, Johnny's got a T-ball game tomorrow and, yeah. and some of that kind of stuff. So I would say intentionality, community, having good couples around you that can, you know, fight for you in difficult seasons, support you, hold you accountable. So you're not your spouse's only accountability partner. And then, and then, you know, working Mm -hmm. on your stuff. I think those things keep you in a good place. No, man, I I really appreciate that. Intentionality is, is, that's, that was a really good point because I remember, and two years ago when, when Clubhouse really picked up, Mm. I was spending a lot of time on those calls and my wife's like, Oh, what are you doing? I'm like, Oh, I'm listening to this call and this guy is this and this. And she was, you know, uh, on her phone watching some TV show or, or whatever. And I met, met one of these guys, Chris Delaney, he, and he talked about intentionality. And I was like, why am I spending time on this? It's not, I'm not being intentional with my time on this platform. So I got more intentional with my business, with what I was teaching others. So it makes sense that you bring that same intentionality within your couple, within your business, within your family. Um, I think I, I really like that. And I think there's some some sort of intentionality that we do have in our, but she's the planner. Like, like okay, kids gotta go, kids gotta go, you gotta take them this way, you know. So there's a lot of that. And then I'm always looking for, okay, I need my two, three hours so I can either work in my workshop working my in my office and do some of my you know work which is going to help move the business forward but i always feel like that i'm putting my stuff always on the back burner I'm like okay i'll get to it oh i'll get yeah. to it i'll get to it and that's part of intentionality right i mean yeah. if you if you plan your Oftentimes we plan our week business wise, like Mm -hmm. this block is for content creation. This block is, uh, I just think we got to do the same thing in marriage. And and to, I think the myth that a lot of people buy into is that a great marriage is, is where everything happens spontaneously. You know, it's like, well, we, we should just know, or, or we should, you know, cause (laughs) dating fools you, right. You you prioritize everything and you don't have to deal with any of the business side. So it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, we just, we were romantic and he grabbed my hand at the right time. And we just knew, and that's not reality in marriage. And so I think, I think we've got to replace the idea of chemistry with intentionality and say, listen, a healthy marriage is one where we prioritize the things that are important. And that may be communicating. That may be sex. That may be time Mm -hmm. together. Like if the things that are important to a relationship are not happening organically and spontaneously uh, plan them. Yeah. Like let, let's be intentional when we prioritize it, yeah. things, things thrive and succeed when we prioritize it. So, yeah, I think, and of course, obviously we live in the world now where romance is, is the priority for any relationship, oh God, right? Yeah. Hollywood and everything else. And I think that's what, you know, gets us, gets us in a difficult place. You know, maybe we need to go back to arranged marriages. You know, I think they, they were actually more stable. Cause if you think about mm-hmm. the per the reason they got married, social status or, or family connections, or, yeah. you know, those things didn't change. And so it was kind of like the reason we got married stayed pretty consistent, but, yeah. but now when the reason is feelings and romance and those change, we're kind of like, ah, oh, dang, I married the wrong person. Maybe you know, it's like, <laughs> we need to dial back to arranged marriages again. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you're right. I mean, there are a lot of arranged marriages happening 
And um, but I think I think there's uh, more than that. I think you're right. There there needs to be an intentionality conversation that needs to happen between the two people because yeah. yes, you're married, and as human beings, we're changing continually. So maybe you change, or maybe the other person change, or and you know, it's just a matter of how and where you take it, and if you're happy or not. Right? Happy. I think. I think the end end product is hey, you got to be happy, or work towards a happy resolve. I think. Yeah. I, I think know. we we can't focus only on happiness, right? I mean, that, no, that seems to be be fleeting. So I think it's uh, you know, and it's and that's combination. where having having some real purpose and shared values and and some of those kind of things in marriage are are the the foundation that sustains us. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we want we want each other to be happy too. So what are right. what are the little things that bring you joy and make you happy and make you yeah. feel cared for and connected and and being intentional again, intentional with those things because I think you can we can again make the mistake of thinking well let's let's say I love affection and mm -hmm. my wife doesn't and then I can get frustrated like well she's just she's done she's not affectionate with me um, and but but if I express a desire for it mm -hmm. and she is intentional with it you know mm -hmm. to me that's almost a greater act of love True. than if she was naturally affectionate and just did it because she liked to right yeah. right and so sometimes we can get it you know we can run down that rabbit trail and be like True. oh well you know I want them to want to and it's like okay but they're not wired like you. So yeah. isn't it loving of them to do something they don't really love doing, but yeah. because you've expressed an interest to me, that's, that's greater sacrifice. Great. And, and, but people get caught, caught up again in this romance yes. idea of like, well, but they should just know, and they should want to. And it's like, no, they're not you like, you know, they're not you. They can't read your mind and you know, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ask, ask for what you want. And hopefully if the other person, you know, is selfless and cares about you they will yeah, make efforts make in that effort. it, it may never be like if you take somebody who is affectionate someone who's not the non-affectionate person is never gonna probably grow to the level the affectionate person would love right you know maybe you're a 10 on affection and they're a two like they're probably never gonna be an eight or nine but right. if but if they move from a two to a five that's huge to me, that's that's movement, that's love, that's yeah. intentionality, and and you can you know dial dial back, give give yourself a couple of hugs in the morning, and dial back from a ten to a seven. We yeah. you know the gap is smaller at least, right? We yes. we may never Agreed. close the gap, fully, <clears throat> but it's smaller. So Eric, we talked about the three points, and one of them is intentionality. What's the second one? Let's go a little bit deeper on that. Yeah, community. So I'm a, I'm a firm believer that the success of a marriage will depend on the quality of community you've got around you. And th this is a lot of why I do what I do. Mm. And it's for, from the membership that I have is to get people around community. The reason I love doing these experiences with six to eight couples is community. The reason I love doing a online class of, you know, 10 to 20 couples is to create community. I, I prefer all of that to one-on-one -on -one counseling Yeah, because there, there's no community. And so I know for, from our lives, you know, some of our most difficult and darkest seasons, it was our outside community that supported us that, gave us hope when maybe we didn't have hope that mm -hmm. held us accountable when we didn't want to be held accountable by our spouse. And, and so I think we just, we're all going to have a season where we need that support. We need people around us who think like us. And, you know, even all the business gurus say that, right. You're, you're the product of the five people you spend the most time with. And that's right. so, so if I'm a married guy effect. hanging out with a bunch mm -hmm. of single dudes, you know, they're, they're probably not going to be moving me towards, what I want to be and where I want to be around. And yeah. uh, so I just think we all need, we all need that community. You know, uh, if you, a lot of couples that I counsel or oftentimes a lot of times when one spouse comes in because their marriage isn't good, but they mm -hmm. can't get their spouse to work on the marriage. Yeah. My first questions are always who's in their life. Is there anybody that can influence them? Is there anybody that has relational leverage that you can call upon 
Um, so like for me, let's say, let's say I wake up tomorrow and I'm like, man, I'm just not feeling my wife. I don't like, I don't want to be married. I don't want to mm-hmm. do the things I committed to doing. I don't want to be here. I don't want to come home tonight. You know, I'm going to yeah. stay out all night and screw her. You know, she can figure it out on her own because we have community. There are a number of guys that I have allowed to speak into my life that she mm-hmm. can call. And I will get a call from one of the, if I try that for very long, I promise yeah. you, I'll get a call from one of those guys saying, Hey, Eric, looks like it's time for coffee, man. See you tomorrow at noon. And, and, and it's, it's the people that I trust saying yeah. you're off base. Like, this is not okay. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's going on. And, uh, and so for me, community is safety for a marriage. It provides security. It provides support. Um, and even at times it provides the, maybe the personal self growth that, yeah. that we need to have outside people speaking in. Uh, so I just think a couple that's not in community and is isolated, it, that's a dangerous place. Man, you made such a huge point with that because first of all, I'm totally down with the mastermind philosophy. You're the bet. You're the, you're the product of five people around you and sure. The better they are, the better you're going to be. And um, so that's huge. But then bringing it to the couple analogy, like, okay, well, that totally makes sense. And I'm I'm looking in my head, who do we hang out with? Who do I ask questions about my family? Not anybody, really. Maybe I'll talk to my brother once in a while, but we're not really talking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, um, maybe there are some friends but I, I'm focused on talking about the business part, not really the family part, right? So I'm, I'm like thinking, okay, who who really is there that we hang out as a couple? And we had a really good setup back, when, back in Colorado because we had just moved to Colorado. And we're like, we need friends. We don't have any friends. So then all the friends that we made either had one kid or two kids because we just had one kid. And then mm-hmm. we really jived together. We really hung out together. We really, you know, the ladies had their conversation and the men had their conversation. And, you know, it was really good. But now here it's it's very different because the people that I'm, that I'm hanging out with, either I'm cycling or I'm beekeeping or it's all of my wife's family. Yeah. So it's like, okay, <laughs> we don't have a mutual person to go to. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, and, so and some, find... sometimes some of that community can be family. Yeah. Um, but it, ha- it ha- family has to be the right people. They have to have the right temperament because right. what's difficult is, you know, you, you vent to your family about your spouse or something and then you love them. So you're going to forgive them and you're going to overlook stuff. But yeah. then you show up, you know, at the next family get together and, and they're all looking sideways at your spouse from the stories <laughs> you told. Every... So, so family exactly. is not always the best for that, those kind of conversations. Right. Um, but I think for me, that's why I'm so passionate about community. I think mm-hmm. we've got to normalize talking about our marriage issues. Yeah. Like n- none of us, I mean, I'm, I'm the marriage guy quotes and quote, right. But I still got issues mm-hmm. and my marriage isn't perfect. And there's moments where I need correction or my wife does, or we need yeah. support. And, and so we've got couples that, that can provide that. And, and we just, we, we need that. And so I, I'm trying, part of what I'm trying to do with all these communities is just yeah. normalize us talking about our stuff because there's mm-hmm. something, there's something reassuring about somebody else dealing with the same stuff you are. Right. So, yeah. so along my journey, I also got a master's in marriage and family counseling. I'm a mm-hmm. licensed counselor, but I can tell you from experience, you know, having been in, in, it, I guess, quote, the, the offended partner or the victim in, in infidelity, there's a big difference when I'm working with a couple and I could give them all the theoretical ideas on what to do and how to build trust. But when you yeah. look somebody in the eye and say, I know what that feels like. I've been there too. The, the credibility and assurance and hope in that is way better than any book you're going to read, any academics. And, and so community can provide some of that, like, Hmm, I'm not alone. No, that's you're you're absolutely right. When when you can relate on another level, and an an activity or a struggle that you're actively going through, and find somebody and and a really great example that 
uh, a host of a show that I was a guest on mentioned to me because he he's been doing podcasts and and when he got to talk to me as a podcaster he's like dude it's almost like uh spider-man far away from home and you know we're we're both spider-man from different generations of different universes talking about problems that we're both facing Mm -hmm. so wow I, i really like that that's that's amazing communities all right, so so what was the third one that we Yeah, the third about? one is is responsibility, really mm-hmm. personal responsibility, and that's that's just recognizing oftentimes our conflict in, in marriage is is not relational but personal. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes we are not the issue, we're just a trigger for something sure. that has not been dealt with. And so from my experience, I don't have a research-based percentage, but a high percentage of the issues for a lot of couples are tied to one or both of their brokenness Mm. uh, that they have not taken the personal responsibility to heal from. And uh, I could give you a million examples. I'll just give you one example. So, so take, pretend we, we talked about um, let's say take a guy who was raised in a family and the family he grew up in was pretty volatile, you know, parents, angry, yelling, sometimes physical. Uh Uh, So that guy, attaches to conflict a huge negative thing i know what happens whenever there's conflict voices are raised yelling things are thrown physical violence so that's a person who's going to avoid conflict at all costs Mm. then you know obviously the dating process doesn't reveal a lot of this because there's not that many things that that we have to have conflicts about yeah so he he marries the girl um who grew up and, you know, dad, dad left when she was five. And, you know, most of the men she's dated have, you know, cheated on her, kind of walked out on her. So she's got some abandonment issues, right? Mm -hmm. Abandonment and rejection issues she really hasn't dealt with. So they get married and dating's great again, because he's super attentive. He doesn't have conflict. So they're not fighting a whole lot. They're getting along great. She's like, man, I feel safe. This is amazing. They get married. And what happens the first time they get into a conflict, which is natural. What does he do? He, he wants nothing to do with it. So he's going to withdraw. Right. And so the, the guy withdraws from the woman who has abandonment rejection issues. How do you think she feels? Oh, no, oh he's abandoning God. me, right? So, so she's going to pursue even harder. And you can, you, know, you can imagine that scenario walking around the house where he's oh like, God. you know, we're done. And she's like, don't walk away from me. And, you know, and so because they have not dealt with those personal issues, now they're struggling in their relationship. And mm. that stuff can escalate over and over. She feels alone and he always withdraws because he doesn't like conflict and she wants to get into conflict all the time. And really for oh, her, right. she's like, man, even negative negative energy is better than nothing. And so again, I could give a million wow. different scenarios like that where, boy, if these two would just kind of deal with some of that and, and heal from some of that, Mm -hmm. he's not going to avoid conflict. She's not going to feel like if he does need to step away because, you know, he needs to cool down. He's, you know, which is healthy. Don't, don't, don't stay in it and say crazy stuff. If you need to cool down, take a few minutes or an hour. And, and so she won't feel abandoned because she's healed, but you just see so many scenarios where, the woundedness is kind of gas on the fire as opposed to every once in a while couples get lucky, right? You get the narcissist yeah. who marries the codependent and it works great because she needs somebody to tell her what to do all the time. And he loves that this person's, you know, thinks he's the greatest thing in the world, but, <laughs> but, but the, uh, the dysfunctions fitting together are, are less frequent than the dysfunctions causing more problems. So we just, we just always, and, and there'll be stuff, in marriage that marriage brings out of you that nothing else has. And so I think like you can do personal work and think you're good and get into marriage and it expose some stuff. And that's Mm -hmm. why I say, if it gets exposed, we have a responsibility in marriage to go this relationship or sometimes kids like, like I thought I was great and super patient as a Mm -hmm. husband. And, and I think I am as a father, my patience is much thinner. And I didn't realize that there was some of those areas in me until, until we had kids and especially one, one of the three 
mm-hmm. has the ability to take me to places the other two can't. And I, I never knew that was in me because I'm pretty yeah. laid back and I'm mellow. And mm-hmm. it's like, wow, this, this, this unique personality and approach. Uh, cause again, I'm super logical, right? Mm-hmm. So this one specifically does all kinds of illogical, emotional stuff. And, and I just, I keep trying to have logical questions with an illogical person. Yeah. And that's what takes me through the roof. And I'm like, I, I can't, I can't be that with this one. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, that's personal totally responsibility. We, we got to work on the stuff that is revealed in us, you know, inside and outside the marriage. So our issues are not continuing to, to hurt the marriage. Man, that's, that's really powerful. And I, I, I love that fact about, yes, number one, be intentional. Number two, have a community. Number three, be, per, you know, have personal work done or, you know, even look at how do you need to grow as a person? One thing that, uh, one thing that Chris Voss mentioned was in any situation, it's not a hundred percent outcome. It's a 200% because both party have hundred percent responsibility on where, which direction the the thing goes. Because if you, if you're thinking it's hundred percent, that means that one person is the victim and the other person takes the blame, you know, is, is the oppressor, but that's not the situation. It's always hundred, hundred. Yeah. And it's not, it's at, not a 50, 50. That, that's why the, right. you know, the whole idea of, well, that's my better half, you know, better half is bad math in marriage. It's, you it know, is. because it's, it's not, it's not addition, it's multiplication, really. So if you take it a is. half times a half, you get a quarter, not the, you know, you, that's why you need a whole 100% times 100%. Yes. Because, um, yeah, you, you, you've you got to. You got you both got to be, you know, fully invested. And obviously, different seasons, different capacities. We're, we're all, some people have a greater capacity because yeah. maybe they didn't have as wounded of a childhood or, or different seasons of life, you know, whether it be work or kids or health or you know, we're not all yeah. going to be firing at a hundred at all times, but, right. but there's different seasons where, you know, you, one may have to carry a little more of the load in a certain area. Um, but, but we got to be a hundred percent invested in, you know, trying yeah. to, trying to put in effort, man. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. This was a fun conversation. It reminded me a lot of the things that I go through every day, right. As, as a married man, as a father sure. of three, um, and it's not easy. It's tough. It's tough, right? So, but yeah. what, but like you said, we got to work on it ourselves. We got to figure out what are the things that we need to work on. What are the things that are bothering our our spouse, and how can we be accommodating as well as um, graceful and grateful for all that they work for us? Yeah. Grace and gratefulness, absolutely, my friend. Yeah, th- those go those go a long way in a relationship for sure. Yes, they do. Well, Eric, it was a fun chatting with you. We I've got a few questions that are you know quick quick fire yeah. questions that help me get a better understanding on where you come from. So, number one, what is the one hobby that you that you wish you got into? Yeah, I think this this would be um, this actually might be. Can I can I pick two? Oh, of course, <laughs> so, you can pick two. Aside, so I think the uh, the one I wish I would have like like I did some music in middle school and mm-hmm. early high school, played the saxophone, some stuff like that. But nice. I wish I would have done like guitar or piano or so, something that I think would have had more translation you know, later, later in life, mm-hmm. uh, just as another outlet, I love music and listen to music. So I think it would have been fun to be able to kind of play or, or do something. So that, that is a hobby I wish. And then on the sports side, I wish I did a lot more golf when I was younger. I like mm-hmm. to golf and I'm average. Um, but I never, you never, when I was younger, I didn't see the merit in it yeah. as a business tool right? As a oh, yes. networking Huge. tool. So I wish now that, that I'm older and, and, you know, a lot of business guys golf and different people, mm-hmm. uh, again, I'm, I'm good enough to not embarrass people, but I, I would have loved to put more time into that hobby if I could dial back for sure. Well, here, here's something that to think about. You are 
taking a lot of couples on these excursions, right? So maybe you can find some time while they're doing their activities to, to go and hit, uh, you know, a couple of round of golf. Yeah. What maybe I really need to do is just invest in a couple, uh, a few less, lessons a just lessons, to yeah. clean up some, uh, yeah, some of my issues. <laughs> I think you got it. I think you could do it. All right. What did you want to be when you were a child? You know, I like looking back, I, I don't think I, I don't think I was that forward thinking. I think mm -hmm. I've always been something which is, which is what fits with counseling and working with couples. Yeah. Uh, Cause a counselor really has to live in the moment. You know, um, that's why if you take people who are visionary leaders and some of that kind of stuff, they may be super wise, but they suck as counselors because yeah. it, it's, it's, you know, underwhelming to sit in front of a couple when there's mm -hmm. a million things you could be doing. So I don't think I, I honestly, so my dad was in the army mm -hmm. uh, for 24, 25 years. And so we moved around a lot. So I really, and my, and my dad's a counselor, he's a, a licensed social worker. So mm -hmm. I really was like, I don't want to go in the army and I don't want to be a counselor. So I was, <laughs> I was more picking out what I wasn't going to do like, than what I was. And uh, here I am a counselor. I'm not in the army, but, uh, but I'm a counselor. So I don't, I, I really can't recall back to, Mm -hmm. I love sports and played soccer all the way up through college and a little after. So there was a little part of me. that was like, eh, that might be fun to, you know, yeah. try to play professional soccer, but uh, not enough to really chase it hard. Nice. I, I like that answer because you said, I don't want to be do those two things, but you know what they say, right? Right. <laughs> Whatever you focus on, <laughs> you ended up being because, you know, it's in your mind. Yeah, that's funny. And I almost went to the Air Force Academy. My dad's last uh, assignment in the military mm -hmm. was in Colorado Springs. So I finished okay. high school there yeah. and I had a buddy who was a year older than me on the soccer team who went mm -hmm. to play soccer at the Air Force Academy. So he was recruiting me heavy. And for a minute, I almost I was like, I cannot go in the military. So I didn't, <laughs> but it was close. It was close. Nice, nice. I like it. All right. What is your favorite movie or TV show? Oh yeah, that's easy. Uh, fav favorite movie, hands down, of all time is Meet the Parents. So oh. I love, I love stupid comedy. <laughs> I love movies, and then right behind it would be Talladega Nights. Mm. I love Will Ferrell. So I love movies that are stupid, funny, awkward comedy that also have like a ton of one-liners that mm -hmm. that then my friends who also like that we can use in conversations. So those those are my top two. Easy, no question. Ooh, I love it. I love that. Yeah, Meet the Parents was 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 really good. I mean, Ben Stiller and and uh, Robert De Niro. Psh, oh yeah, and Owen Wilson in there. Owen was, Wilson, uh, yeah. I didn't really like the two follow ups. The, the yeah, Meet the you know they try and, hard. They, they try hard, but the original was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next one. What movie would you choose if you got to play a character in it? Oh man. Uh, probably like one of those, some, some kind of, some kind of comedy. I would, mm -hmm. I would want to be in a comedy. I love jokes. Uh, I'm super sarcastic, which my wife doesn't always love, but I've always got a, a quick witted thought, a mm -hmm. joke. Uh, I love when people make fun of me, which is, you know, that's probably a whole nother show. It's yeah. not, uh, uh, not everybody loves it, but for me, it's almost like it's endearing. Like when people make fun of me, mm -hmm. I love it because the people I make fun of, I do because I love them, you know, yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> so I'm almost like, oh, they like me. This is fun. Well, you know, there's there's a thing about that because you can only make fun of people so far because if you cross the line, you might get slapped, you know. Hey, I've heard that. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've heard that that could happen on TV. Even. On yeah, TV. So, so that that could very well be me uh, yeah. standing on that Oscar stage, uh, getting <laughs> getting a hand across the face for sure. Oh man, that was something else. That was something else. I, I'm I'm rethinking of what I answered once a friend of mine asked, <laughs> "What would you do if you were, you know, if you were Will Smith?" So. <laughs> Yeah, not the answer is not that. Uh, not that again. Exactly. Well, here's a here's a, here's a perfect tie-in. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about personal responsibility to heal past areas. Well, mm -hmm. if you if you know anything about Will's book that he did with Mark Manson that came mm -hmm. out recently, and you know both him and Jada, if you look at their whole red all all their mess, they both come from unhealthy 
mm. families of origin. So there's a bunch of baggage driving everything from their open marriage to all the stuff they do is driven by woundedness mm -hmm. from my perspective. So Will talks about in that book, I think when he was like nine or something and his mm -hmm. dad hit his mom, it was a moment he remembers that he wished he had stood up for her. So, so you've got this lifetime yes, building. I remember think, that. think about all the humiliation that he's had at the red table and with Jada's entanglement and all these other things. You've got this, this whole life buildup of a guy who maybe hasn't stood up for himself or, mm. or, you know, wished he would have done things different. And so that moment on the stage there, you know, he's got his wife and all their dynamics. So I, you know, who knows how many times in their marriage, maybe she's even said that to him, you know, yeah. you don't cover me or you don't mm. stand up for me or you, we don't know what's going on, but, yeah. but it's that undealt with pain that causes a guy on national TV who he's much wiser than that oh, to yeah. walk so up there fun. and, yeah. and do that to, and obviously maybe it was strategic because he knows, you know, Chris Rock is small and he knows he's obviously not going to try to fight me on national TV because you don't normally slap a guy and then turn your back and walk right. away. Right. That guy's going to light you up with a, you know, roundhouse. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but I think, I think that's a perfect example of mm. undealt with, stuff because uh, you know i i try to put myself in in those mm -hmm. you know and and probably would have been frustrated obviously and and upset about it but you probably give the guy a look and yeah. then at the break you get in the back room and say you know that's not cool you owe my wife an apology and and you know let's not cross the line that's yeah that's the healthy approach right so, right right Thicker so yeah, but that's tough in the moment. We never know what we'll do in the moment if we have it. The good thing about those is there's a lot of people thinking about what would I do in the moment, which will hopefully make them, if they ever get in that moment, make a better decision because they've actually thought decision, about it, yeah. right? Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. And that's something that that he's going to have to live up to or live with for yeah. the rest of his life, right? For it's sure. It's never going away. <clears throat> there's there's all sorts of memes. Yeah, there will um, be memes for life. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> um, next question. Who is your favorite superhero? My favorite superhero? You know, that's funny. I've not I've not thought about that. I think when I when I dial back to my uh my little kid days, I know I had Aquaman under Uh, so I've always liked uh, Aquaman, nice. Uh, but I think like Green Lantern, I, I always loved the Green Lantern for some reason, and uh, so yeah. And then I think about my comic book days, I like yeah. the Hawk, so there's Ooh. there's quite a few. I don't know if I have a, a, a favorite, be one of those guys. All right, we'll pick Green Lantern because I like Green Lantern too. All right, good. All right, last question if you are a board game. What would it be? Ooh, if I was a board game, I would probably go with Risk. That Ooh. was growing up. That was one of my favorite games. I, lo I love kind of the strategic side of it, and, mm -hmm. you know, world domination and takeover. I remember there was a season where we would set that up with friends and you could never finish it in a day. And so the board would sit set up at one of our houses while we had like a three or four day or week, depending on how much time we had oh, to, to fin finalize the game. So I would go with the risk. That actually reminded me of the episode on um, Seinfeld where uh, Newman and Kramer were playing really? risk. Yes. And Kramer brings the board and he leaves it in uh, Jerry's room, Jerry's house. He's like, you're like Switzerland. You're like neutral territory. <laughs> we can't leave it in my house. We can't leave it in Newman's. And it was there was like different ways that Newman would try to get into Jerry's, or they're like running around, running around, holding the board in the street. It was it's really funny. <laughs> like they would go in and cheat or something when the other wasn't around. Or... Yeah, yeah, that's it hilarious. Was, it was a fun episode. Yeah. Eric, it was so much fun talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time out and you know talking with us on how to better our relationships with our spouses. Appreciate you. Where can my audience find you? And if they wanted to book you up or you know jump in a consultation with you, how can they reach you? Yeah, just alteredmarriage.com. So it's spelled A-L-T-A-R-E-D marriage.com is the best place and there's resources on there i've got a free guide to intimacy on there as well that they can download and get a free tool um, and they'll see my youtube channel and podcasts and all the other stuff um, classes that kind of stuff so that's the best place awesome 
Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and we'll talk to you soon. You bet. See you soon. Thank you for listening to Hacks and Hobbies. You can find additional information on the guest today on their website, hacksandhobbies.com. Please feel free to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on upcoming interviews with amazing guests.